Good morning. My name is Sophia Hoffman, and I'm a sophomore at Baylor University studying economics, and I will be your session chair for Block 1. Now, to kick things off, I would like to introduce Kyle Byington, a senior at the University of Akron who will review their paper titled Beyond the Dollar, Quantifying the Effect of Ohio Library Operating Levy Revenue. Kyle, the floor is yours. All right, my name is Kyle Byington, and I am a uh, senior in the economics department at the University of Akron. I am also the fiscal officer for the Twinsburg Public Library, so libraries are kind of my world. And I'm here to talk to you today about quantifying the effectiveness of Ohio library operating levy revenue, um, specifically after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So just to give you a couple quick facts about libraries in Ohio, and in 2021, there were 7.7 .7 million cardholders in Ohio, library cardholders. Uh, there were a total of over 59.6 million individual visits to libraries and circulation, which is the number of items to get checked in and checked out. There were over 158 million SERPs in Ohio libraries alone. So Ohio libraries are pretty special. Now, all right, so, um, there were over $1 billion brought in in operating revenue in Ohio libraries alone. 970 million of that was uh, tax revenue from either the operating levies for Ohio libraries, which are voted by the individual um, uh, authorities of their circulation or of their library districts or the public library fund, which comes directly from the state's general revenue fund. So Ohio libraries are unique in that we do fund libraries directly from the state's general revenue fund. Currently, it is set at 1.66% in permanent law. Our temporary law running through the uh, July of 2023 is 1.7%. And uh, uh, Governor DeWine is currently looking at putting that into permanent law at 1.7%. So what I really am looking at uh, today is the fact that uh, we have seen an increase in operating levies, the amounts and the amount we're receiving in revenue uh, compared to the PLF. Uh, PLF revenue has, um, even though it has increased, the percentage that we're seeing uh, from the general revenue fund has decreased over time. So what I'm looking to see is, does an operating levy have a positive effect on our performance indicators? And our performance indicators in library are circulation, uh, <laughs> circulation, uh, visitors, and uh, program attendance. So looking at some of the literature and theory on libraries, most economic literature for libraries is data envelopment analysis. And that's where you measure the utilization of resources. And I'll be honest with you, libraries generally are inefficient at optimizing their resources. So that's something I want to look at further in the future. Uh, also, their um, reliable revenue and technology access is very crucial to the success of public libraries. And uh, this is coming from international and uh, United States research. So uh, also, a couple of important theories to look at is the illusion, illusion of diversification theory, and that is where uh, you think you have revenue coming from multiple sources, but in fact, because you have a very complicated tax system, it's coming from the same source. So if you see economic downturn and all your tax revenue is coming from the same source, but you don't realize it, you're much more impacted than if you had separate uh, tax sources or if you had a separate source such as um, fines, fees, and other services that you're charging for, which is in even less uh, elastic than uh, income taxes or property taxes. And then uh, also operating revenue affects performance indicators in other public entities. So there's a lot of research in schools that shows when you have an operating levy, it actually affects performance indicators such as test scores more so than say capital expenditures do. So what I did to uh, analyze my data, I looked at the uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services. They do uh, national data for all libraries in the United States that submit data. In Ohio, all 251 entities submit data to uh, IMLS. And then I pulled data from 1998 to 2019. 2020 data, there is just a lot going on in 2020. And it really was unusable data um, for looking at any sort of models. So I did a difference in difference uh, two-way fixed effects model. 
And the explanatory variables that I use for control variables are, or the DID uh, is my explan main explanatory variable, which is having a levy as of 2009, because we are really interested in seeing what happened during that financial crisis. Did those operating levies help the libraries to uh, retain or have more circulation program attendance or um, annual visits? And then the control variables are uh, PLF revenue per capita and collection size per capita. And those are both continuous variables. And then percentage of operating revenue used for materials and the percentage of operating revenue used for labor. Those are indicator variables based on the summary statistics. So having an operating revenue, if you're using uh, over 15% for materials, that's considered a high uh, use of material expenditures, and that's a one, otherwise it's zero. And then for operating revenue for labor, if it's over 62% uh, of your operating revenue going towards labor, it's considered high labor expenditure. So that's a one, otherwise a zero. Now, um, I did have a lot of libraries between 2008 and 2013 switch into from my control group to my treatment group. And so I did some summary statistics and if I would have included all of those, um, I would have had um, I would have had a bias towards zero. I would have had a bias lowering my effect. So I ran the summary statistics. Summary statistics were very similar between the two groups. If I excluded the groups that are the libraries that switched between 2009 and 2013, there is a slight upward bias um, in those results. But I do think that slight upward bias probably balance out the downward bias if I were to include all of the libraries uh, in Ohio. So I ended up with 198 libraries. One other library did not have reliable data for the entire data set. It was on and off. So I went ahead and just excluded that library altogether. And then I looked at 1998 to 2013. After 2013, I just have too many libraries that switch. And so it becomes a little unreliable not being able to estimate the bias. And I, can, I did convert continuous variables to per capita to reduce the bias that would be created by the larger systems, such as Cincinnati Public, Cleveland Public, uh, Akron, who um, all had levies throughout the entire time period. So uh, I did do a balance of regressors. I did a variance inflation factor check. I did a parallel trend test. And then I also did a uh, correlation matrix just to see what my variables were doing with each other, how they related to each other. The big takeaway for this slide is that there are no stars. That tells me that I am running parallel groups for, for my before treatment between the A and the B group. So post recession results, um, as you can see here, having a levy as of 2009 increased circulation per capita by three circs per person. Um, that's huge. That's a huge number that tells me that there is something going on um, with having this secondary source of income. I looked a little further out. We look at 2013 and you can see that um, coefficient increases to 3.6. So I know that it is a lasting effect of having this um, secondary source of income uh, on our circulation statistics. The other two program attendance per capita and visits per capita are also significant, uh, but those numbers tend to be a little less reliable because they're still like hand counted. Sometimes you've got people doing tallies by hand, uh, whereas circulation is pretty much automated throughout the entire state of Ohio. And the overall uh, significance, the adjusted R square show that it's a more reliable model as well. So in conclusion, um, basically, having a levy does positively affect these outcomes. Uh, some of the limitations include the fact that Ohio libraries are very unique in having this uh, PLF. And uh, also, Ohio libraries are political subdivisions. So they are political bodies themselves. So they have the authority to go to the ballot box, whereas in other states, they don't. So it does kind of limit the use of this research in other entities. Uh, some further research that I want to look at is understanding other factors that affect circulation, because, for instance, in uh, Summit County, uh, libraries get their PLF funding. It goes from the state to the county, and the county puts it out through a formula. Circulation is part of that formula for the percentage of PLF that you get in your county. So I want to see what else goes into circulation. And then advocacy. Uh, there is language in Ohio Revised Code that allows us to, gives us the authority to go to the ballot box through our taxing authorities. And I wanna make sure that we are communicating the importance of retaining that language in Ohio Revised Code. And then any questions?
Thank you, Kyle. Uh, following each presenter today, our discussant will provide their comments on the presenter's research. It is my pleasure to introduce our discussant for session one, Sipo Longa, a junior at the University of Central Florida. Sipo, take it away. Thank you. And Kyle, this was an amazing presentation on an amazing paper. I just want to get that out there. I, when I first read the paper, I was, I was, I became more and more interested as I read on as someone who used to live in Ohio and loved the library. I happened to be someone who lived in Cincinnati. So the Cincinnati library system was great to me. Um, I never thought of it in this complex of a way. And I really enjoyed the background research that you had that really sunk me as a reader into the research question that you had. And then it was just a unique perspective in my opinion. Uh, I would really like to know about the implications of these findings in maybe other states with similar policies and how that um, would benefit, uh, how they could similarly benefit uh, from the results of your study being applied to something that they might research on their own. But other than that, again, an amazing presentation and an amazing paper. Well, thank you. I do appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I've been in libraries for 18 years now. It really is my passion. And it's great to be able to bring um, my major and an academic background to my passion. Uh, really, there is only one other state that's even comparable in a style of funding, and that's Hawaii. Um, but where a Hawaii maybe gets 20 to 25% of their money directly from their state's general fund, uh, libraries in Ohio are getting around 50%. So there really isn't um, anything super comparable, but that would be the one state that I would also look at when it comes to data in how they have a secondary source of income uh, that's not tied to say a city or a county government. And that's another thing that I would um, like to look at is how entities that are not tied to city and county governments fare compared to those that are under city and county budgets like having that level of autonomy with your budgeting, how that affects, um, especially efficiency and effectiveness. That's amazing. Yeah, I guess one last question for you, would, for me at least, would be how did you end up at this particular question? Oh uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, I will have to give uh, some props to um, Dr. Inami at the University of Akron for helping me kind of hone in because what I'm really interested in looking at is optimization of resources in the future. And so I need to understand the resources, which is our tax revenue primarily, before I really look at optimization. So it was kind of taking a step back to move forward. Gotcha. Well, again, thank you. That was amazing. Okay. Thank you, Sipo. Um, I would now like to open the floor for questions for Kyle. Uh, virtual attendees, like mentioned before, please share any questions you have in the Zoom Q&A section. And if you're in the room, please feel free to raise your hand and you'll be called on. So it looks like we have one question in the Zoom Q&A currently, and it's um, when completing your research, what surprised you most in the results? Um, I did confirm my hypothesis, which is kind of nice when that happens, uh, but holding all else constant, there was a relationship between circulation, or I'm sorry, between um, items per capita and uh, program attendance. And, and the items per capita way it was defined in my paper was physical items. So as we're moving into a more digital world, I am interested to see if that relationship holds true as I'm looking at data further down the line, if I'm looking at more current data. Okay, and now it looks like we have a question in the room, if you'd like to go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just had a question about when the libraries get access to the levy revenue, mm -hmm. is that offset by say a decrease in access to the general fund or is the levy revenue just a income shock to the libraries that you're seeing? Yeah, it is a completely separate secondary source of income. So it doesn't offset in any way. Um, Ohio, with Ohio Revised Code 5705.23, we have the, op the option to go to the ballot box. And then through permanent law um, and in permanent budget, we have a set percent that the state gets in aggregate for the public library fund. And then that is dispensed to the counties based on the amount of tax revenue they receive with basically sales and income tax. And then the counties get to decide how it goes to the libraries, but it is restricted to the libraries. 
So there's another question on Zoom. Um, what are your plans for this research moving forward? Um, sure. Uh, one thing that I really want to do with this research moving forward is maybe look at some other years, not just the shock. Um, that's one of the things, because it was the financial shock that kind of gave me an AB. It gave me a difference in difference model that was really dramatic. Um, but I would like to look at, say, 2017 and see if the diff what the differences are in 2017 as an AB, or um, say even before the financial crisis, when I didn't have a lot of libraries that had, when I had only had like 30% of the libraries in Ohio that had an operating levy as opposed to having 70%. So looking at some different time periods to see if that uh, coefficient holds. Okay, and now for the question in the room. Yeah, um, you partially answered it there. I was a little bit curious uh, what your identification looks like in terms of sort of having an operating levy, not having an operating levy as you kind of come into the crisis. And how frequent is it for places to not have one? And then if you could comment a little bit about how different are places that rely totally on the state fund. Sure, sure. Um, and in Ohio, um, as of about 2006, 2008, you only had 20 to 30% of Ohio libraries that had an operating levy. And it was like, as soon as that financial crisis hit, there was kind of a, you know, panic moment and everybody went out and tried to get one. Um, Ohio levies, Ohio operating levies are very popular for libraries. Um, everybody loves their library in Ohio. So they have about an 80% approval rate. Um, right now, there are I want to say 51 entities that still rely on uh, only PLF. I know it's 20% of libraries in Ohio and there's 251 libraries. Um, and they rely solely basically on PLF. You do tend to see, I have worked for a couple of those entities actually, and anecdotally, you see that they do charge more for say fines and fees. A lot of libraries have gone fine free. Um, and so we are still seeing those libraries still charging fines because they do need that small source of revenue or um, charging for notaries. For instance, that's something that a lot of libraries do as well as notary service. A lot of libraries offer free notary service. I've seen two or three of those libraries personally that I know, and of course that's anecdotal, that are still charging for say notary fees and things like that to have another small source of income coming in. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, and I, yeah, I was kind of impressed with sort of how much variability there was really in the, the sort of operating levies. Yeah. So I yeah, and they do. It, as clear in the presentation. Yeah, and, and they do go up. You know, you have some that are only like two mil, and then you've got some that are say five, six, seven, eight mil, and you've got some that have multiples. So I did just run. You know, it was a uh, indicator variable. One, you had the levy. Zero, you didn't. Thank you so much for answering all of those questions. Um, you did a great job. <laughs> um, now I would like to introduce Brooke, ha Brooke Hathor, a junior at Case Western Reserve University, who will review their paper titled, Put the Test to Rest, an analysis of pandemic onset test optional policies in college admissions. Brooke, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna wait for the slides to be put up. Awesome. Yeah, so just as she said, my name is Brooke Hathorne. I'm a junior double majoring in math and economics at Case Western Reserve University, and I'll be presenting my research on test optional policies in college admissions. During the COVID-19 pandemic, standardized testing centers across the country were forced to cancel, restrict, and reschedule testing in compliance with health and safety protocols. This created a shortage of testing, prompting hundreds of colleges and universities to adopt what is called test optional admissions, a policy under which students do not have to submit their SAT nor ACT scores for acceptance. Historically, standardized tests have been used to predict an applicant's applicant uh, academic success at the institution to which they are applying. Um, their problem is that underrepresented minorities, women, and low-income students perform significantly worse on these tests, all else equal, coining the phrase that standardized tests are a barrier to admission for underrepresented students. We use this all as motivation um, with the natural experiment of the pandemic to test whether test optional policies increase student diversity and also pose implications on the admissions landscapes for these schools at a whole. The angle of my research is that colleges and universities 
can use these results to determine whether they wanna retain their policies um, after the pandemic. So the only economic journal article so far um, that is focused on test optional policies studied ones that went into effect from 2009 to 2014, and they were pretty small schools, um, and they find no increase in diversity. So I hope to contribute to the literature by updating these results with um, the elite R1 private institutions during the pandemic, um, and hopefully find some different results or significant results. So I want to study um, Case Western and specific and similar universities. So I use private schools that are in the Association of American Universities, which are all R1 institutions. Um, further studying these elite universities, I think is really beneficial because admissions at such places are highly contentious, spotlighted, and also have the opportunity to change a student's life. Um, the challenge with this natural experiment, however, is that Schools that weren't already test optional, most of them did end up going test optional during the pandemic. So it was pretty challenging to find a suitable control group. It turns out that Florida State University system remained test requiring during the pandemic. So I utilized them as my control. So here's a full list of my treatment and control schools. You can see all eight Ivy League, Stanford, MIT. Um, and here's a comparison of summary st statistics from fall 2019, which was the last um, fall before the pandemic. Um, obviously, Florida is not the best comparison group, and I'll talk about this later, but I propose using a different econometrics model so that we can utilize a better fitting control group for these schools. So I compiled data from the 2016 to 17 through 2020 to 21 admission cycles from the integrated post-secondary education data system, which is a government run database, as well as each university's common data set. Um, the year of post-treatment in the study is 2020 to 21. I'm still waiting on all the 2021 to 22 data to be um, put into the system and it should be any day now. So once it is, I will incorporate it into my regressions. The econometric model I use um, to study the effect of test optional policies is diff and diff with fixed effects, um, time and institutional. Um, I use fixed effects because there are numerous schools, both in the treatment and control group, and I'm looking at a span of multiple years. Um, I studied five outcome variables on which parallel trends held, the enrollment of underrepresented minority students in the first year class, as well as the same for black or African-American students, and the gender ratio, which is measured as the percentage of men in that first year class. Um, I also wanna look at um, if the number of applications increased after such policies were put in place and whether the 25th percentile SAT math score for those students who chose to submit their test scores um, had any effect. So here's the graph for the enrollment of um, first year black students. Um, the black line represents the AAU schools, my treatment group and the green line are the Florida schools. Um, once the pandemic hits in 2020 and test optional policies go into place, you can see that big kink in the treatment graph and then the slight decline um, for the Florida schools. Specifically, um, we find test optional policies to be associated with a 1.49 percentage point increase in the enrollment of black students in the first year class relative to the Florida control. And this is significant at the 5% level. Here are the rest of my graphs for all my other outcome variables that I study. Um, and these two in the highlighted column are statistically significant. Here's my full regression table. So up top is just standard difference and differences. Um, and then also I incorporate my time and institutional fixed effects. And I kind of cut and paste this um, table in my results slides. So um, for the gender ratio, we find a 1.1 percentage point decrease in the enrollment of men, which corresponds to a 1.1 percentage point increase in the enrollment of women in the first year class, which corresponds to about 33 more women enrolling at each private AAU school on average between 2020 and 2021. This isn't too significant considering that um, there are hundreds if not thousands of women coming in for each first year class. And I didn't expect the gender ratio to be affected so heavily just because um, women are already very well represented at these um, elite schools. I copy my results for um, black students. Um, this corresponds with 29 more freshmen enrolling at the each AAU school. And since each of these treatment schools has about 130 black students in their first year class on average, this is very economically significant as well. 
Um, for underrepresented minority students, I find a 1.7 percentage point increase, which translates to 40 more students enrolling. Um, this is pretty economically significant as well, although not statistically significant, since each school only has around 170 underrepresented minority students. Um, and on to the effects for the admissions landscapes. I find a huge increase in the number of applications submitted, over 5,000 between 2020 and 21 relative to the Florida schools. And considering that most elite universities charge about $70 to $80 for their application fee, this could lead to uh, revenue gains for admissions upwards of $350,000. Um, and this is also statistically significant. And then the last one is the 40-point uh, boost in um, the 25th percentile SAT math score. Um, and it's not that students are doing exponentially better on their SATs this year. It kind of follows this um, behavior that a lot of admissions counselors have been predicting. Um, so there's asymmetric information between um, the students who are applying, but also the admissions counselors. Um, as an applicant, you don't know what are the competing test scores of your other applicants in the group, but also um, what constitutes a good test score in the eyes of the admissions counselors. Um, so if you're, the one good thing you can rely on are historic distributions of test scores for those students who are admitted or enrolled. So if you look at last year's distribution and you're on the lower end, you're probably um, less likely to submit your test scores, maybe you're hesitant that they could hurt your odds of admissions. But if you're at the top end of the distribution, that's great. They um, look very impressive. So you'd probably wanna submit that. So the fact we're seeing such kind of an increase in that lower percentile and a shrinking of that middle 50 really shows that, um, that um, applicant behavior hypothesis that I had, as well as a lot of other admissions counselors is probably playing out. So this was just the work from the first semester of my honors capstone. I still have one more to go. Um, so my main goals are to fix the two limitations of, that, um, of this institutional analysis. So one, I'll add more data once it's available so we can test that these results maintain significance and are retained past the pandemic. Um, also add more outcome variables because I'm hoping to use this econometrics model that I hinted to earlier, difference and differences in reverse. Um, so instead of always having a control group that never gets treated, you compare your treatment group to a group that's always treated. So that's always had a test optional policy. This would allow us to use schools such as Brandeis and UChicago that are actually part of the AAU themselves as um, our, control, our control units. So this has actually been the motivating factor behind my whole research project. So I've been working with admissions and I'm gonna get de-identified student level data from applicants to Case Western from these past few test optional admission cycles, really comparing students who submitted versus not submitted their test scores. We have some test scores for students who applied test optional, withheld their test scores originally. So that would be great to compare. I would love to use a propensity score matching model to look at, is there an effect of being test optional on such things as likelihood of admission, um, academic performance and retention? I'm really answering the question, is there something different about students who apply test optional, all else equal? So, thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions, and thank you all for listening. Sipo, at this time, if you'd like to provide your comments for Brooke. Yes, thank you. Brooke, again, another amazing presentation. I feel like you've both done a really good job of keeping my intention, even though I've already read your papers, and giving me more information. I really enjoyed that. Um, I want to say that the paper was extremely well structured and all of the conclusions were really so, well, uh, well supported. So it was easy to follow along and kept me engaged from like beginning to end. Uh, I would say that I would be interested to know um, like what the comparison looks like between private institutions that did adopt the test optional policy and those that did not. I know you mentioned U Chicago was a school that might be in a comparison in the future. And so that kind of answered that question or like that curiosity, but I'm really excited to see where that goes. Um, but other than that, I really don't have any questions for you because again, you were just so thorough. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Sipo. Uh, now I'm going to open the floor for questions for Brooke. Um, like before, if you're a virtual attendee, please feel free to put any questions in the Q&A box. And if you're in person, you can raise your hand. Hi, a quick question about your data. So the idea being that these schools say they're test optional, 
but are you able to see like what percent of admitted students actually didn't submit a test score? So I'm thinking like, you know, U Chicago says they're test optional, but if 95% of their admitted students submitted an SAT or ACT, are they really? Yeah, so um, I'm pretty sure this um, statistic is available on iPads. It's definitely available on each school's common data set, which is about like a 25 page document that lists um, standardized kind of data points and it's um, the same across the country. So you're able for, to look at transparent um, comparisons. Um, I know Case Western at least, I'm pretty sure that they had, it's about 50-50. So that would be definitely something I'm interested in studying and incorporating in my analysis. If there's any more questions in the room, um, be happy to. So uh, I'm kind of curious, did you do any efforts to see, you, you pointed out that the control group is a little different than your, than your treatment group. So I'm kind of curious if you had done anything to look at subsets of your control group or subsets of your treatment group to see whether you could make the treatment and control more comparable. Yeah, so I actually, um, to get this um, treatment group that I had, I narrowed it down from a, a much wider pool of um, institutions. So my driving factor behind that is looking at schools like Case Western. Um, but I also did try like taking one certain institution and maybe trying a synthetic control model against Florida schools. I couldn't get a great pre-treatment fit on those. Um, but I also kind of was curious and just looked at um, case itself. Um, but I also had a suggestion from um, my academic advisor back at case um, when I presented my honors capstone presentation last week to maybe even look at different uh, schools that are like more in the South that are a better comparison group to Florida to see if that kind of holds for either robustness, but also just check a different subset of schools. So I'm gonna plan to do that next semester. Hi, um, actually building on that question, so, um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about what you were planning to do with the propensity score match, which I guess would be what may have uh, addressing uh, the, the question you just heard. Like, you know, before I let you um, do, do so, I should say, and it's fantastic to see you doing this doing this uh, um, work and indeed, uh, you know, using, uh, anticipating the use of methods such as propensity score matching is really a research one here. I was just talking to my colleague in front of me, <laughs> Tate here, about how we should be using um, probability score matching with some of our own research here. At the so, in short, great to see you doing this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm, so the main um, question I'm looking at would be we, so the, uh, would be, where the main indicator I should say would be whether you're a submitter or not a submitter of test scores. So um, we'll calculate um, the likelihood for the control group to be in the treatment group and um, also with the treatment group and then match the uh, control and treatment units based on that um, and see whether or not um, there is a statistically significant difference in things like whether you're admitted. Um, also, we'll subset that to the students who did enroll and see um, are these test optional students less likely to um, grad or not graduate. We don't have that data yet, but um, enroll in the next fall semester. So keep that retention, but also look at academic performance. Is their GPA a lot lower? other things like that. And hopefully the study could be extended well past my time at Case within the de admissions department if they wanna see how graduation rates are affected or anything else like that. I also just wanna look at either using propensity score matching or just a standard OLS with controls. Are there statistically significant differences in the groups of students that apply um, test optional? So are you more likely to apply test optional um, if you're coming from a certain group like rural students, maybe underrepresented students, things like that. Okay, at this time, I think we're out of time for questions, but Brooke, you did a great job. And I'm going to move on to introducing our third speaker for today, uh, Katie Merritt, a junior at Case Western Reserve University, and Helen Lee, a junior at Case Western Reserve University. They will be presenting on their paper titled, What's for Dinner? An Analysis of Pandemic Onset Test Optional Policies in College Admissions. Katie and Helen, the floor is yours. Okay, 
Um, so I'm Katie. I'm a third year at Case Western Reserve University majoring in economics and nutrition. Um, and this is my capstone project I've been working on this spring semester with my partner Helen Lee, and then I'll be continuing it in the fall um, for honors by myself. So we look at online food delivery. Um, Specifically, we're interested in online food delivery because we've seen the popularity of online food delivery services increase in recent years, like anecdotally in our lives and then also in the data. And especially with the pandemic, we saw that the adoption of online food delivery services increased and um, the usage of these food delivery apps has remained high even as the pandemic is easing. Um, so that suggests that people might be um, incorporating online food delivery into their normal food consumption routines. And why should we care about this? Um, online food delivery has the potential to change the way we consume food if it's changing our routines. And the way we consume food has an effect on a lot of things such as dietary diversity. Um, we could also look at food expenditure behavior, um, revenue for the restaurant industry or food security. So for my research project, we specifically looked at food expenditure behavior. So our question is, what is the effect of online food delivery apps on consumer food expenditure behavior? And we're gonna look at two main categories of food expenditures. So we have food away from home and then food at home. And um, the distinction between these relates to where the meals are prepared. So um, food away from home is meals prepared away from the home. So they would be prepared at a restaurant, but it could include dine-in, takeout, or delivery. So you might eat it at home, but it's prepared away from the home. And then food at home would be meals prepared by the consumer in their home. So this would include grocery purchases. And so we're specifically going to look at the ratio of spending on food away from home to food at home. So we want to know for every dollar someone spends on food at home, how much are they spending on food away from home? And just to be clear, online food delivery could fit into either of these categories. So you could have prepared meal delivery like Grubhub, Uber Eats, where the restaurants prepared the meal and then you get it delivered but there's also Instacart. And so that would fit into the food at home category. But um, for simplicity, we just focused on the food away from home online food delivery apps like Grubhub and um, DoorDash. So overview, um, we looked at a location time fixed effects model as well as a difference in difference regression model, but I'm just gonna talk about the fixed effects regression today. Um, and our main finding is that we find a negative but statistically insignificant correlation between online food delivery app popularity and the spending or ratio on food away to food at home. So there's growing interest in the literature on online food delivery, um, but no papers look directly at the effect of these online food delivery apps on food expenditure behavior. Um, a lot of current literature is limited geographically and then also by time. So um, a lot of the studies are before COVID. And so um, our goal is to derive an estimate for the effect of online food delivery on consumer expenditure behavior that's externally valid for the US after COVID. And so when we think about what we might see in the US, um, we think that once online food delivery app popularity is increasing for these prepared meals, um, more people are going to incorporate online food delivery into their consumption routine. But from there, we think there's probably a heterogeneous effect depending on how someone incorporates it into their diet, like what it substitutes for. Um, so on the left, you could envision someone who doesn't feel like cooking dinner that night. And so they decide instead of cooking for myself, I'm going to order a meal on Grubhub. And so in this case, we would expect an increase in the food away from home to food at home spending ratio. But you could also envision someone who says, instead of going and dining out in a restaurant, I'm just going to order the meal. So it doesn't change the way they, or it doesn't change the amount of food at home they're consuming, but it would change their food away from home. We think it would decrease their food away from home spending um, because people tend to spend less on online food delivery meals than they do when they're dining in because they tip less, they get less alcohol, they're also less likely to get a fancy meal, they might be more likely to get fast food. And so our data is from 2017 to 2021 and comes from three main sources. We use the consumer expenditure survey um, where the unit of observation is household um, by month by metro area. Um, we also use Google Trends for online food delivery search term popularity. Um, again, just the meal online food delivery. So Grubhub, DoorDash and Uber Eats. This is by week by Metro. 
And then we have controls for COVID cases and um, restaurant restrictions from the CDC, also by week by Metro. And some quick summary statistics. Um, you can see the source of the variable, the variable name, and then um, on the left side of the box is 2017 and the right side is the value in 2020, 2021. Um, so we can see that the food away from home to food at home spending ratio is lower in 2021 than in 2017. Um, for our demographic, our demographic variables, the values are pretty consistent over time. And then for Google Trends, we see that the popularity of the search terms is higher um, in 2021 than in 2017. And so, like I said, our primary econometric technique is a location time fixed effects regression model, where our outcome is the spending ratio on food away to food at home. Our variable of interest is online food delivery popularity, again, just the meal delivery terms. And then we have controls for COVID cases and restaurant status. So for this one, um, a value of zero was no restrictions. Two was when the government said you can only have takeout. Um, and since we had this on a weekly basis, we um, averaged it over the month and it became a continuous variable. And then we have controls for age, education, income, family size, and whether someone receives SNAP benefits. Um, so the fixed effects model allows us to look at the correlation between online food delivery and the spending ratio within metro quarter units, and also allows us to control away some effects of the pandemic, also time and variant differences within the metros, and then things like increasing um, or improvements in app technology that would affect um, everyone across the country. And so here are our initial results. So we have the most simple OLS regression and then we add our controls and then eventually add the fixed effects. So you can see that the coefficient on our variable of interest, the food delivery popularity is negative for all of our regressions, but we lose statistical significance once we add um, the COVID and fixed effects controls. But overall, the correlation we're seeing is that as online food delivery popularity increases, um, it's associated with a decrease in um, food away relative to food at home spending. And so um, just to give you an idea of economic significance, if we were to interpret our fixed effects coefficient, um, we could say that a double in online food delivery app popularity is associated with a 4.6% decrease in food away to, relative to food at home spending. But still, what does that mean? So on a household level, if we took um, an average household in our sample, which spends about $300 per month on food, um, this change would um, be associated with about $5 less in food away from home spending per month. Um, so on the aggregate level, if you thought of like a whole MSA, a whole metro area, there's about 7 million households. So if each of them is spending about $5 less per month on food away from home, um, that would be a very large change in um, revenue for the restaurant industry, um, could be like $35 million. Um, and then the other thing I wanna point out is our demographic controls all have statistically significant coefficients in the fixed effects model, all else equal. And um, so this tells us, especially for the food stamp recipient variable and the restaurant restriction variable, um, these are accounting for a lot of the variation in our model and might explain why we're not getting a statistically significant coefficient in the fixed effects model. So the main takeaway is that we cannot reject our null hypothesis that there's zero relationship between online food delivery and the food away to food at home spending ratio, but we are observing a negative correlation within um, the MSA quarter units for our fixed effects model. And the biggest shortcoming of our study is really the data. So we need better data on online food delivery to understand how consumers are actually incorporating it into their consumption routines. Um, we think there still is a relationship there, but just the data we have isn't specific enough to identify the causal relationship. Um, so for example, the consumer expenditure survey that we're using um, currently does not distinguish between online and in-person food purchases but they do this for other goods like clothing and household items. Um, so one takeaway is that if we had data like this and we knew exactly what households were using online food delivery and what spending category it goes into, this would help us better get at the causal effect. Um, other shortcomings of our research, um, Google Trends is not a perfect proxy for online food delivery order volume. 
Um, you could envision someone who uses online food delivery a lot and they would have the app on their phone or they would bookmark it on their browser and wouldn't necessarily Google it every time. And Google Trends only tells us when someone's Googled it. So that's not a perfect proxy for order volume. Um, additionally, um, I have some time, controls Katie. listed here that we did not include in our model, but could include possibly in the future, such as food prices over time by location. Um, at this time, you've run out of uh, time for your presentation. If you'd like to move to the discussant section, Sipo. Okay, real quick. I just want to say, so this is um, the end of my first semester of my capstone. So um, I'm open to feedback on where to go in the future. And yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for that presentation. Um, I know when I first got a hold of your research paper, I was quite interested because I personally do order a lot of food in and I occasionally make food at home. So it kind of hit home in that regard. But as I went on and I read, uh, I really enjoyed um, the proposed methodology that you put forth and how well your research question was supported uh, throughout the paper. Uh, beyond that, I would kind of be curious to know what the implications of your findings could really be because it seems like there's so much that you could pull from this data. I know you've mentioned that some of it needs to be improved upon to make it a little bit more conclusive. But all in all, I'm really curious to see where this goes. And as you said, with this just being the first semester of uh, maybe two, where you'll be diving into this a little bit deeper, I'm excited to see what the end result happens to be. Um, other than that, amazing presentation and thank you. Thank you. Okay, now leading into the Q&A session, we have one question on Zoom and then we'll kick it over to the room. Um, the first question is, is there data comparison between online grocery delivery versus in-person grocery shopping? If so, how does that compare with the restaurant food ordering? So right now we don't really have this distinction anywhere. Like I was saying with the consumer expenditure survey, if they would start tracking um, whether someone bought something online or in person in their food categories, we would see this. Um, there might be another way to proxy um, for food delivery that in a, in a better way than we did with Google Trends. Um, someone suggested to me maybe doing like app downloads by Metro over time or um, yeah, we had a few other ideas of how we could get more um, specific data on online food delivery, but to answer your question, that data is not out there that we know of right now. Um, so I, I think one of the interesting things that you could do with this is to you know, think through where are restrictions really important and how are restrictions changing over time? And how do they impact sort of this decision between um, at home or away? And then um, compare that with sort of how does the entry of apps? So mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure, but I mean, are there, are there metro areas where you actually can see a, a app enter into the space? Yeah, so actually one of the papers in my literature review did that and um, they were looking at the entry of apps into New York counties, I think specifically Grubhub, um, but it was 2014 to 2017. And so I don't think that's exactly externally valid after COVID because like COVID changed the way we consume food a lot. And when it entered the metro area, that wasn't necessarily, I mean, it was a different time. Um, and now it seems like the apps are in most places around. We thought about doing like a rural versus urban comparison because rural areas would be less likely to have the apps, but then there's a lot more um, differences between urban and rural that would be hard to control away. Um, so, yeah. Hi, just a quick data question. So you mentioned Google Trends and I was looking at what you were searching. So just a thought that kind of popped into my head that they're publicly traded companies, mm -hmm. right? So I was wondering if when you were looking at your data, if you saw maybe any irregularities when like Uber puts earnings out, for example, mm -hmm. would you see a big spike in the trend or maybe like, if you're looking at it regionally, say a place like New York where the financial sector is very concentrated, mm -hmm. if those effects around earnings are even more exaggerated in that region specifically. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, we didn't look at, we should definitely look at if we continue to use the Google Trends, like uh, external factors that would be driving the trends. So yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. 
Hi, yeah, it's great to start. Um, I also had a question about the restaurant restriction status there. Well, you, you spoke um, but quite briefly, so if you could add a little more, more detail to me about how econometrically you took what was a kind of zero, one, two variable and essentially took an average within the month to render it a continuous variable, and that's what you used in your regression. So I just wondered econometrically whether you'd sort of thought about the alternative strategy of putting the variable in as a as a dummy variable, whether that yeah. could buy you something different. So I just, just welcome your thoughts. Yeah, um, I actually got that exact comment from someone else when I was um, showing my presentation. Um, and so, yeah, I decided to do the average because I thought if you if you had a value between zero and one, then you would be getting a metro area that like closed during or reopened during that month, but it wasn't necessarily, like if you just did a bunch of dummy variables, you wouldn't get, like if, if it was, um, if I had a value of zero, which means restaurants are fully open and then a value of one, which means they're um, limited capacity dine-in. Um, if during the month there was a change, then I, I was worried the dummy variable if I just assign one value to each of them, it wouldn't um, capture that the, the restrictions actually changed during the month. So that's why I did the average. But um, if you have feedback on how to do that better. Thank you so I don't know much. I your question. Very well, but. <laughs> um, that ends the Q&A session for this block. Um, Thank you for all the presenters. Uh, please join me in thanking our presenters and our discussant for a very interesting session.